uh, a good time talking to you all this morning. I wanted to come back again and finish uh, or continue the discussion here about positions and naming positions. Because <clears throat> this is such a great question, you know, how do we identify positions? What are the numbers? We kind of ended with fourth position there and starting to talk about fifth and what changes in fifth position and above. And I, you know, I said earlier, um, if you didn't get a chance to watch it, you can go watch the replay. We're talking about positions there, the, you know, first through fourth position. In some ways, yes, I am thinking about third position. Okay. I mean, fifth position, excuse me. I'm thinking about fifth, like what the, is that actual number? But really, in, in, in the big scheme of things, in the long run, big picture here, I'm thinking about the big landmarks and how my hand uh, relates, like what are my fingers doing in relation to those big landmarks. For example, you know, I, I said earlier, when my hand goes to fourth position, okay, and I have an extension, I usually, I usually never think of, say, D sharp or G sharp or C sharp, okay? I usually never think, in talking about where my first finger is, I usually never think of that as third. I think of it as fourth, and then I'm extended back, right? Fourth, extended back, because fourth position is such a familiar position for me. I always know where that is. And so just feeling that and letting that finger come back. Once I get above fourth, okay, and I get get into fifth, it's kind of the same thing in reverse about what I just said about third. I'm really thinking fourth and then up, uh, up a half step. And depending on what the exact notes are, once I do get to fifth position, it's it's pretty rare that I use my fourth finger. It's just it's just clunky. I don't know. There's something. It's it's hard to coordinate. It's hard to get my fourth finger down there. I'm not going to say I would never use it, but I've, you know, learned to relax my hand. And so usually when I'm up there in fifth position, I'm doing one of these, all whole steps. If I have to say play F sharp, I'm sorry, F natural G and A there. Okay. And I think fifth and sixth, this area right here, because we are using this violin type fingering, I think these are the hardest positions to get in tune. Once we get up here and my thumb finally comes with me, um, then and the notes get closer together, these are actually easier in many ways than trying to play down here because if we're going up here for something like for the B flat or for the A, third finger air, the harmonic, it's probably in the context of something else coming back. And so bringing our thumb all the way up or, you know, or coming up here or using fourth finger, it just, it's logistically and physically very difficult and so usually when we go to fifth it's just necessary it's just better for us to use a violin fingering here all right you can use one three four like you're playing in an extension there but i don't know it's awkward to me now because i'm so used to stretching my third finger and playing all whole steps. And what I suggest is if you start using this fingering, is that you make up your own little etude here. cross buns. I still love high cross buns, even when we're super advanced. Right? Okay, I won't bother doing the C string. All right, well, I like to do the C string. better already, right? And then I would do the same in sixth position. Because my thumb is back, right? Or I try to, maybe, maybe I can bring my thumb with me to get up to that B. If 
I'm not thinking about fifth position and sixth position, okay, if I'm just thinking half steps and whole steps, what is my point of reference? Well, the A harmonic is a biggie, right? Like I said, I use big landmarks. So this A harmonic... And the reason that's such a big one is that, you know, is my third finger on A, is my second finger on A, is my first finger there, all right? And once I get first finger there or thumb there, all right, it just makes sense that, you know, we have A, B, C, D. The next big landmark is the next big harmonic, which is the E. And that's my other reference, okay? Am I first finger on E, second finger on E, third finger on E? All right, what am I doing there at that harmonic? Or if my thumb is on the E, E, F, G, A, right? And actually that third finger is the next harmonic, that harmonic, okay? So the harmonics here, the octave shifts, become my big, big landmarks, all right, to get around here in the upper positions. And then it's just a matter of, are my fingers half steps or whole steps apart, right? So for example, let's go back to fifth here. Cold cross buns. Do I have a half step? All right, it, that's why I call it violin type fingering because I'm leaving fourth finger out. Am I, do I have a half step between two and three? Or do I have a whole step, right? Am I going up to the G for a B flat? And I would challenge everybody to really try to play sixth position like this, okay, without bringing the thumb, especially if you have a B flat. Maybe if you have a B natural and you really got to get the hand up there, bring the thumb with you. Usually, though, up to a B flat, my thumb stays back here behind the neck, yeah? Now, I know you're thinking, like, okay, well, that's fine, Clay. You've you know, played cello for 30 years, the rest of us, we need to think in positions. Well, yes and no. I mean, what, what really gets your hand, okay, and even down here, right? I mean, because I have the video about, you know, intonation for frustrated beginners, or if you need to improve your intonation, you're having trouble playing in tune, finger patterns, hot cross buns, cold cross buns, something familiar, something you have in your ear. And it's no different up here. So when we introduce thumb position, we're getting up in here into, gosh, I have to count it because, uh, yeah, I don't think about it. So fifth, sixth, all right? The harmonic is seventh, right? So really we're getting into eighth position, right? Because about where our first finger is. D major scale. Let's play a little, you know, how do I get eighth position in tune? That's how we usually start the thumb position, yes? And then how would I get, say, 10th position? I'm sorry, 9th position in tune, right? So we got play the scale. It's now an E major scale, yes. Check myself with the harmonic, big landmark. string, okay, I'm thinking, as I said earlier today, half steps, whole steps, big landmark, where, you know, what is the relationship between my fingers as I'm going up there, all right, and I'm kind of looking at this A harmonic, here's another more practical, or even more practical, that, that said, this is very practical, all right, but another example um, from the repertoire, the swan, right, so when I'm going, <laughs> shift coming right as I'm going to that B what am I thinking about am I thinking about going to sixth position usually not usually I'm thinking about I'm roughly thinking where is the a harmonic yeah I mean first of all I've practiced what does it sound like to get from you know you know from F sharp to B getting up there in tune now if I want to reference it's that harmonic again. It's that A, right? My second finger on the harmonic, all right? What finger is near a big, big landmark, right? 
And what do I, what can I remember, what can I recall about what that feels like so that... And that, if I want some sort of physical visual reference, that's what I'm thinking about, okay? Second finger on the harmonic. Now, what about the next one in the swan? What am I thinking about? I should slow down. All right, because you're going to go up to the D this time. Now, as I go to the D, what finger's on A? The thumb, right? So I'm still thinking about the A harmonic, right? It's just that my finger changes. I'm not thinking eighth position. <laughs> you can tell I don't think about it because I have to sit here and count. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay, all right? Because I'm not thinking about that number when I shift up. I'm thinking about the big places, okay, on the fingerboard, okay, about where to go. And that, okay, if I'm looking for you know, geography to help me, right? Numbers or references, right? Because that's what this is, right? You know, first position is a reference in my mind. Second position is a reference. Third, fourth, all these are references, okay? But once we get up here, all right, because the notes are already kind of close together. If I was really thinking first, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, I mean, this is like, they're so close together. I, I don't think there's any way my arm would ever really know the difference, okay, number-wise between that, all right? I just have to think about which finger is on which big place, all right? A harmonic, E harmonic, A harmonic again, okay? That's what's going to help get you in tune, ultimately, to play in these upper, these super high positions. And, of course, just getting familiar with how close the notes are. That's where the French folk song stuff... I always have students play everything, you know, the first ten pieces, or sorry, the first nine pieces from Suzuki Book One, all the D major stuff. <laughs> Find the next harmonic up there. to me, all right, what this sounds like, I instantly am more in tune It doesn't have to be from Suzuki Book One, it could be anything that's based on a scale. Joy to the world, or... Right? Any familiar tune will help you navigate the half steps and whole steps up here in the upper positions, all right? The big landmarks. It says, also, could you possibly show us how to tune a cello? Absolutely. I have a whole deep dive video about that here on the channel. Um, it's called, uh, it's just called Cello Tuning or How to Tune a Cello. Yikes, I don't remember the exact title, but it is here, all right? It's a lot of information. But I tell people, if you'll just watch it, sit down with it, okay? Watch it one good time. Of course, you can go back and reference it as many times as you need to. But if you'll really deep dive in it, you know, take notes, do all the things, all right, then you'll be good to go. Of course, I made that during the pandemic when everybody was learning to tune themselves at home and not going to in-person lessons. Um, but yeah, the information is still good. Um, yeah, go and check that out. Uh and hopefully that will help you. Maybe maybe in a future live stream, if we need to do it, do a live uh, cello tuning, we can 
we can do that. That's a great question, though. All right. Super practical stuff there with the tuning. All right. So that's playing in fifth position. I, I just want to make sure I say again for anybody that's new joining us, I said earlier, as far as playing here in fifth and sixth, I think number one, all right, just like when I'm doing the, you know, the tunes or the Suzuki or the whatever up here high, is just getting comfortable with my fingers here in all these whole steps. Because my fingers are really stretched out for these whole steps. Okay, so I gotta, just gotta play something familiar. I just gotta make up my own etude, right? I gotta do something. See there, I'm not thinking about position, I'm thinking about ringing tones. Get that G, in tune with that G. And just getting my hand comfortable up there. really wonky, uncomfortable places, all right? You just gotta spend some time there. Get your hand, get your hand used to it, okay? All right, beautiful, all right? Cool, you're welcome. Um, yeah, thanks for the comment. If you guys have any other questions, um, be sure and check out the live stream from earlier where I was talking about, for, uh, talking a lot about first, second, third, how to name them. Um, probably, you know, because of my own feelings about playing up high where it's just big landmarks, right? I think that kind of influences my belief down here about, you know, um, we just have first, second, and third. I talked a little bit about, you know, what happens when you try to number every single half step down here. I don't think it, I don't think it's a great idea. All right. The big, the big places. All right. And then all the small noodling around. How do you remember where to put your fingers without looking? Well, that is one of my favorite topics, actually. Because um, I actually, here we go. Here's a Clay McKinney original. Um, I don't like the term muscle memory. I know. And sometimes, and sometimes I still use it because um, it's just, we haven't come up with a better phrase, right? But like, what do your muscles actually remember? It's your brain that remembers, right? And so my own personal theory is that our hands and our fingers are moving towards the sound. And I've talked about this a little bit on the channel. I'm gonna have another channel where I talk just all about musical listening and science stuff. I'm not a neuro, I just say the disclaimer, I'm not a neuroscientist. I am not a medical professional. I'm just a curious cellist, but from my own rudimentary uh, reading and understanding about how the brain works, okay, the way things get transmitted and wired through our brain, you have this part of your brain known as the thalamus that kind of acts like a way station, yes? So like when information comes in, when we see something or taste something or smell something or hear something, you know, any of our senses, it passes through lots of things actually, before it ever goes out to our extremities where they decide what that information is, right? Yes. And so if that's the case, then as I'm reaching for something, right, my brain knows the difference between a sound represented here on the fingerboard and just say an object out in space. Like if, I'm, if I reach over here for my cell phone, right, that's just a physical object that my eyes see, yes, out in space, okay? But a sound on the fingerboard, all right, is an aural something. And I believe, I am totally 100% committed to this idea that our hands are reaching for a sound. They're not reaching for a physical thing out in space. They're reaching for a sound. Absolutely, they're reaching for a sound. Um, it's just, it has to be the case. Just has to be the case. I believe that wholeheartedly beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I hope that one day science will, will prove it, okay? Um, the other reason I believe that, a little bit more practical uh, advice here, why do, why do I believe that we're moving toward sound, reaching toward an aural something in our brain? Well, I believe 
I believe that is the case because of the way finger patterns help us. Yes. Um, if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, okay, this is this is my favorite best analogy I can give you for this. There's that moment, spoiler here, um, where Neo, the main character, he like can see the Matrix, right? He can see like all the little representations of what's there. When we do finger patterns, okay, when we force our hand and brain to um, represent itself on the fingerboard in so many different ways, all right, we turn the fingerboard into a grid and we understand the geography. We sort of understand the grid relationship of all the little intersections there, all right? But the only way to get there, actually, is to play lots of different ways, not just one way, okay? Because I, I know that's kind of an old way of thinking. It's like, let's play one way, let's get this one thing really good, and actually that's the slow road to playing in tune and getting your fingers there without looking, all right? The best way is to do finger patterns and like, like so. different. My knowledge of where my fingers need to go is just better. All right. It's improved. Um, the other thing that does that is scales and pairs. For example, what I mean by that. And then I go to B flat. see here because of this octave anyway all right and you can keep going with that oh man after you do this in several iterations over several scales several finger patterns several strings you're you're like, it really does feel like that moment in the movie where he sees the matrix. Like they, you just, the fingerboard is now represented differently in your brain. Okay. So you, somebody asked, you know, how do you get your fingers to the right places without looking? This is how, this is how it's, it's all based on what am I hearing? Okay. And connecting that sound to all the stuff that's going over here. Yeah, man. Finger patterns, finger patterns. You know, I just, every time we do scales now in the studio with all of my in-person students, I'm like, scales and pairs. Scales, three different versions, right? The, the, the days of... Okay, I did my G major scale, now let me move on to my piece. That, that kind of scale work is why so many people go, what's the point of scales, <laughs> right? I mean, it's true, right? You do one scale, you go up, you come down, it's very linear, okay? It's not a grid, right? I'm not learning anything about the grid system of the fingerboard if I just do a one-off scale and then I'm done, all right? I gotta do the arpeggio, all right? I gotta do like the relative minor. I gotta do G and A and B flat or C and G and then C, right? It's like do, you know, G major going to fourth position and C major going to fourth position, all right? So I get that relationship of up a string, down a string, okay? You gotta pair it up and you gotta rock your brain here you gotta this this pattern interrupt okay that forces our brain to change all right and form new connections it is so powerful it is so powerful to helping us play in tune all right and 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 learn the fingerboard and ultimately over a course of time of doing this this is when you get really comfortable okay you know not looking all right um in in reality, like as I was learning this myself, 
how did this come to be? Etudes. Etudes, yeah? I mean, etudes are basically pieces of written out patterns, right? There's, there's some sort of sequence or pattern, and it happens for eight or ten bars, and then the composer's just repeating it for two pages, right? So, of course, popper etudes, if you're in any kind of, you know, performance program, pre-professional program, um, you're going to be playing popper etudes, and it's just pattern after pattern after pattern after pattern after pattern, all right? And ultimately, all of those sequences and patterns and doing things, because, you know, you end up doing things in, you know, with all the arpeggios and all the different accidentals that come with playing popper etudes, you're just all over the fingerboard all the time, yeah. And it just, it increases your knowledge of this fingerboard geography, this turning the fingerboard into a grid system. Anyway, I could go on and on. I know I get a little redundant there with that, but it's just, it's, once you, once you start to appreciate this, it's so powerful for your practice and your learning. Love the question. So when you're reading notes, do you just, wait, so when you're reading notes, whoa, oh, it went away, it went away. How do I get back to the chat? Hold on. What did I do? Hold on. Still not used to the... Oh, something happened. Hold on. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Okay. So when you're reading notes, do you just automatically know where to put your fingers because it's so hard for me to read the notes and play at the same time? It keeps fading, so I'm on my iPad here. Um, come on, show the thing. Um, at the same time, especially on like pieces where you have to play fast. Um, I'll make sure I understand the question here. Uh, yeah, well, it's just experience, right? It's not a, this is not, you know, I'm here on a live stream now, 26 minutes, you know, espousing all these things. But I've played cello for 30 years, right? I've played since I was 11, okay? And I'm 46 now, okay? So, a lot, you know, you can't, you can't deny the power of experience and then I've just done this a lot, okay? Um, you know, when you're playing in an orchestra also, which you have to do a lot as a college major or playing an ensemble, you know, one of, one of my part, one part of my story here is that from the moment I got a cello in the sixth grade at 11, you know, I was playing in church. Like, like every other musician raised in the deep south uh, and going to church, it's like, hey, come play in church. And, you know, when my uncle, who's a church musician, was like, hey, come play for my choir. You know, and I got was playing Bach cantatas when I was, you know, 14. Um, and so you can't you can't look around if you're trying to look at the page and look at the conductor and, and listen to the choir. And so just sheer, you know, baptism by fire is, is part of it. Um, and then the experience of playing an orchestra where you have to watch the conductor and you have to listen and watch the notes on the page and there's no chance to look over here, any kind of tapes, right? And you do it enough, right? And this is why it's like this, this term muscle memory is such a, a double-edged sword and why we revert back to it, and even I revert back to it, is that your muscles are learning to do something, right? Our, our muscles do learn skills, right? But it's up here that the information is held to command those muscles to repeat the action, right? So... Let's, I don't want to deny the, the physical aspect of it, of that, yeah, these muscles have to learn to do this thing, and they have to be built up to do this thing, okay? And you also mentioned playing fast. Another favorite topic of mine is to remind people that you can't learn to play fast at the last minute, right? When it comes to playing fast, you're also, again, building that up over time, right? Which is probably what made me think of it just now. It's like, you know, when you're learning a fast passage and you're practicing it, even if you practice for four hours, you know, say you practice two measures for four hours, which I think is a complete waste of time, you have no idea what you accomplished until the next day because that's how our bodies work, right? You break a muscle down. Remember, when you're training over here on the cello and you're moving your bow and fingers and going and everything, it's just like doing the weights, any kind of other strength training. You're breaking that muscle down, and then in the evening, you rest your body builds back up, the muscles build back up stronger, and you come back the next day, and it's better, right? I would I would never spend more than like 30 or 45 minutes max. God, 45 minutes on one passage of music. I haven't done that since the college days, because I know better now, all right? Well, I'm more efficient with my practice, but also it's like, at some point, like, that's it. 
you know, you have to plan ahead. You have to start a month or two early. You can't do it at the last minute. And you have to realize that you don't know what you accomplished until you come back the next day. So don't forget that aspect. So there is, a, I don't want to deny, there is a very physical aspect to what you're doing. It isn't all just neurons and chemicals and, and connections and, you know, matrix analogies, okay? That's a big part of it. I think it's the majority. I think it's much more the majority than we give it credit. But the other 40, 30 percent, it is very very physical what we are doing okay so i do i love i i love that question right um and so you know grant yourself a little grace grant yourself a little patience it's the number one thing you can do when you're learning okay and when you're a student yeah love the comments keep them coming All right. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for hanging out. Oh, wow. Look at us here. Um, I'll be back again, maybe tomorrow. Uh, some, something else. I'll pop on here. There's going to be some more live streams. Next week, I am planning to go through, over the course of the weekend, I'm planning to go through the entire Suzuki Book 1 and talk about different practice points, okay? How to practice. What do we need to do? What's the checklist, okay? And all of that stuff. Um there all right over the course of some live streams uh next week and i'm breaking it up because i have some students playing in solo and solo and ensemble i gotta run out make some performances i got some seniors it's gonna be their last time it's solo and ensemble i can't believe it um so we're gonna break up some of the live streams there and actually i need to break them up even a little bit more there on the channel but stay tuned for those next weekend and i look forward to hanging out with you guys again here online thanks so much